Well, hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles program, a weekly show that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program that focuses on what's going on in the world of the Beatles newswise. I'm Ken Michaels, best known for my weekly syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner and many Examiner columns, and even for Goldmine Magazine. That being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Uh, hey, everybody. On today's show, we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to be talking about Paul McCartney. <laughs> Again? No. <laughs> you know, honestly, Steve, I don't recall. I mean, I know Paul, when he puts out a new album, he does a series of interviews. He does you know, a decent amount of promotion. This is the most I've ever seen him do. Yeah, he's been really he's been really doing a media barrage, and, and it's not over. He's got uh, he's got a couple things coming up in the UK, and I would not be surprised if something else happens over here too uh, when the album is is, is released next week. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we tape this, it has not been released yet. But yeah, we're we're yeah. recording on John's birthday. We're recording on John's birthday <laughs> on October uh, the ninth. Happy birthday, John! Wherever you are. Um, Which, by the way, reminds me, you have something. You you had a very important story that you broke on Beatles Examiner about John. Yeah, that was a uh, that was uh, very uh, over the weekend. I I learned from Jillian Lomax, who runs a magical history tour in Los Angeles, that the Lennon Walk of Fame star had been defaced with graffiti and drawings and all sorts of weird things and. And I report. I was the one that reported it to the Walk of Fame. Uh, she told me about it, but I, I have a contact uh, at the Walk of Fame, Anna, Anna Martinez, who runs, who actually is in charge of the whole thing. And I contacted her and and let her know. And she got. They got a crew right on that, and got the whole thing cleaned up in time for the birthday today, hmm. which was very cool. And and uh, interestingly enough, and uh, it. The, story got picked up everywhere it went viral in usa today hollywood reporter it, it just all over the world and um you know it, it i mean i'm glad that they got it they got it all fixed up because there's the annual the annual celebration there tonight um that's going on with uh that chris carter hosts uh -huh. and um so that's kind of uh, interesting that uh, i'm glad that they got that fixed up in time yeah that's the main thing. I mean, what kind of idiot would do something like this? But, um, you know, nothing surprises me, but I'm glad that they do have, you were saying they have surveillance cameras there. They so, have surveillance cameras, and there's also a nonprofit group, the Hollywood Trust, that takes care of the stars, and we want to give them some credit and give them, give them a shout-out for, for what they did because they worked real hard to get, that, uh, to get that star done. Universal went down on Monday, first thing and then the trust took over and got it all straightened out and uh so uh i'm glad it's all it's all nice and clean and back to normal for the book celebration tonight right and we have you to thank for that well well partly partly, partly. <laughs> well well kudos to you there steve thank you so our show today is about paul and um we're going to talk about his interview that he gave to howard stern which was yesterday, and um, if we have time, we'll also talk about uh, the interview and and the show. Paul was on Jimmy Fallon. These uh, things yeah, happen the previous night on these, Monday. These things happen so rapidly. I kind of envy you, Steve, because you can report things daily. I'm doing a live show every single week, and then you know I did a show last Wednesday, and I found out about Jimmy Fallon a couple days before Paul was supposed to appear. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Howard Stern. So it's not like, you know, if you tune into my show, you're going to know everything you need to know of what Paul's doing, because he's doing so much. Well, but the Stern uh, thing didn't didn't break until, or didn't, wasn't announced until the day before, which was um, because he announced it on his show on Monday, and then the interview yeah. was yesterday. Um, the Fallon thing, yeah, I mean, those things get announced in advance, but nobody knew about Stern until yesterday. I mean, until Monday. And so that was, you know, there was a lot of uh, rushing around, and he didn't put out a press release. The word came from people who heard Howard's show. So, you know, I thought, uh, as I as I just wrote, I, I wrote up a piece this after, um, that I just published. I thought the show, the Howard Stern show was surprisingly um, warm for Howard Stern. It was. Uh, it and 
it was it was actually as I started as I said in the beginning of what I wrote up, it was almost like somebody else took over Howard Stern's body because <laughs> he was so warm. And even at the at the end of the show, said, you know, I, I love you, Paul, and all of a sudden I'm going, is this really Howard Stern? Because sandwiched, you know, around the McCartney interview was the usual Howard Stern shtick. Hmm. And I, I mean, stuff that I can't, that we can't even say here. I mean, or I don't think that we want to say here. You know, uh, and it's, I mean, it was almost incredible that uh, there were, you know, the contrast between Stern before and Stern after and Stern with McCartney. It almost made me wonder if his previous interview with McCartney and the one he did with Ringo kind of put, had somebody put Stern on notice. I don't know if anybody could. But well, you you printed something in one of your articles, the one where you were announcing that Paul was going to be on Howard Stern, that Howard actually said that he thinks this is probably the last time he's going to get to interview Paul. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't know if that's kind of a, there's a, I don't know what that came from, but he, I mean, he really, really just um, was so sweet and loving to Paul, it was amazing. I mean, the last time, you know, I mean, he, uh, you know, Stern has brought up, for example, um, uh, his interview with Ringo. I remember hearing that, and it was like, it was amazing, some of the stuff that he was actually asking Ringo. Again, stuff that I'm not, I'm, uh, you know, and I'm, uh, I'll be honest, I am not a Stern fan. I do not listen to him on a regular basis. Uh, I know people who do. Neither am I, but he, he does really do give interviews. I mean, good interviews. And uh, and I will say that Stern, while I don't like his show, I don't like what he does because I think he goes for the lowest common denominator. The man mm. is incredibly intelligent. Incredibly intelligent. And I really wish he did not, you know, I mean, he could do so, so much better at a higher level, but he chooses to go for a certain kind of audience. And they, of course, love that. And they, right. And they eat it up. You know, he asks about people's sex lives mm -hmm. all the time. And he's done he, that. He's done that with. I mean, he's talked about uh, John and Brian Epstein. Uh -huh. um, with Ringo, he even asked about uh, body parts, and I'm not going to go into any more detail. But I remember. Kinda, <laughs> you can kind of guess what what I'm talking about, and it's just. I mean, he did not do that yesterday. The closest he got to that was talking about Jane Asher. Hmm. And, and you know, living in the Asher household, but he was very respectful, incredibly respectful from McCartney to McCartney yesterday. Well, you certainly have to realize that Howard Stern is very much a Beatle fan, and it shows. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he knows a lot about them, and this interview comes across as someone who's not just you know this big media personality but a real fan and he's read a lot of stuff that's been in Beatle books through the years and he's questioning a lot of things that you don't really know if it's true or not and a lot of the questions are very good questions and so, he even he even said almost something nice about Yoko yesterday and <laughs> he has he has really gone after Yoko in his books and on on the show before mm -hmm. and that in itself was amazing that he that he conceded that Yoko was an in, was very instrumental in John's solo career, and he has he has been incredibly critical of Yoko, incredibly. I thought he was asking Paul, wasn't Yoko a big influence on John? No, I think I think it was more of a positive statement, myself, because uh, I listened to the even when I was writing up what I wrote up, I was listening to the interview again and. No, he was. It seemed to be. He seemed to me he was relatively positive there. Hmm. He certainly was not being very critical. Right. And you know, I, again, that I think is just really astonishing, given his past history. And he's, he's so many times gone in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So, Ab and this absolutely. was so. This was very warm and fuzzy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it even really, at the, it really was. The end of the interview, he's thanking Paul and saying how much he loves him and how much he appreciates that he took the time to be with him. And, you know, it's, um, he, he, he gave it such a respectful tone. And, Here, here's uh, what he said. And I, didn't, I even left off part of this because I took it straight from the interview. It said, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart how much you mean to me, how important you are to me, 
and to know that you would spend some time with me moves me to no end. It's really a treat. I mean, <laughs> how much more how much more loving can you get? <laughs> you can't. And and it was amazing. It was. I mean, I I sat there with my you know with my mouth hanging down, listening to you know the way he was, and it was just astonishing. It really was. Right. Hmm. Well, why don't so, we talk about uh, the content of the interview and some of the things they discussed? They ta- he, he went he went through the whole. Uh, I mean, he talked about uh, Yoko being in, in the studio during Get Back, and he and that was a little critical, but not he, even so. Stern held back on what he could have said uh, there, but he gave, he asked Paul about uh, Yoko in the studio and uh, how they reacted to it, and he and McCartney admitted that they didn't like her there because they he thought it was they thought it was a guy thing, right? Which we all know, and. He said, but later on, we sort of sudden, suddenly sort of thought, you know what, John's in love with this girl. He wants to bring her into the studio. We've got to cope with that. And we learned to cope with that. So that was actually an interesting admission on Paul's part, that they realized that John loved her and they had to accept her, even if they didn't like her. And so wanted that, her that, with him all the time. Right. So that was that was interesting. He also talked about Earlier than that, he talked about uh, the early days with John Lennon and whether his father, whether Paul's father, had said he didn't want him hanging around with John. And he and McCartney said he didn't mind John. Didn't he? And and that's Howard funny said, because I'm starting to read Mark Lewison's book, and it does say there that that Paul's father would say, you know, don't hang around with John. You know, he's a troublemaker, that kind of thing. I that's what it that's says in that's wonder, what it says in Lewison's book, not word for word, but Paul's father really didn't want Paul to associate with John. I wonder if that's where Stern got that. I, I wouldn't be that he didn't mention Lewison, hmm. but that wouldn't surprise me. But um, Paul said, "Well, almost, but but by the time I met John, I had a little say in the matter," which is an interesting sentence, anyway. So, and then, like I said, he talked about Yoko and and. Uh, he also uh, countered the fact that Yoko was was John's support, and he credited Linda for helping him. And because they talked about maybe I'm amazed, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, and so and and again, there everybody knows this that Linda that he he's always credited Linda, so that was not a surprise. But but uh, he did talk about that. Yeah. What I found interesting, probably one of the most fascinating things in the interview, and it's kind of ironic bringing this up because we just had Peter Asher mm-hmm. on our show, and I had talked about, I asked him about some of the artists that have been rumored to have auditioned for Apple mm-hmm. that the Beatles turned down. Right. And here in this interview, they bring up Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Yeah. And mm-hmm. Paul did say that they auditioned in front of George, George Harrison. Mm-hmm. And George said, no way. <laughs> Can you believe yeah, I that? Left, I left that out of the article, but yes, that's that is true. I mean, it's one thing to turn down artists who are unknown. You've got three established people here mm-hmm. <laughs> from different famous bands, and I'm sure. Well, certainly, <laughs> George was friends with David Crosby. Right. You know, the, the Beatles are friends with them, and Graham Nash. Come on, <laughs> how could they say no? It's a Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, because, uh, you know, there's all these... I mean, the birds were at that L.A. press conference that the Beatles did, and 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 uh, Roger McGuinn has said many times that Bells of Rimney, uh, or uh, George was... Uh, there was a connection there between Bells of Rimney and George Harrison. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Mm. interesting. It's more than interesting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just don't see how George could have said no. Those mm-hmm. harmonies, that talent. <laughs> I mean, I just I'm baffled by that. Yeah. And you know, it, it's been rumored through the years that Fleetwood Mac was turned down, and as I said to Peter Asher, and he he said that he he left at the time, so he probably couldn't comment about it. There's a book that Norman Smith put out shortly before he passed away, where he mentioned David Bowie, and also Queen. You mm-hmm. know that they were turned down by Apple, but at least in this interview, you know, Paul does confirm that George Harrison said no to Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Mm-hmm. Also, um, at the very beginning of the interview, they, they talk about Helter Skelter, 
and um, Howard asked Paul if he thought that that was the beginning of heavy metal. And, you mm -hmm. know, P Paul doesn't go around analyzing himself <laughs> and what he does, but he brought up the, the story that he's told many times that The Who, that Pete Townsend had, had made a comment in the press that The Who had just recorded the loudest, dirtiest uh, song they ever done, mm -hmm. and that inspired Paul to want to do the same thing. Right. But, um, you know, Howard is kind of saying that really was the beginning there, wasn't it? of heavy metal, and, and then Paul said, yeah, I guess you could call it that. He went but back he doesn't want to give himself the credit. Right, he went back and forth a little bit on that. First he didn't want to take the credit, and then he finally did. And so, yeah, that was, that, was a, that was an interesting moment there, too. It's an awkward thing for, for Paul to take credit for something like that, because as far as I'm concerned, the Beatles started so many different trends and, and influenced so much in music. I think the Beatles really started progressive rock. Mm -hmm. And you'll get a lot of people who will challenge me on that. Mm. You know, yeah, but you, I mean, I think everybody was watching them back then, so it it's not really that much of a stretch uh -huh. to say that you know because they were because they because they as we all know they progressed continually through their career and and so yeah there were there were a lot of things that uh, I mean they were they ground they were groundbreakers in so many areas so sure yeah. But was Helter Skelter the first heavy metal song? You know, John Lennon did say he thought Ticket to Ride was. Mm. I mean, that's John's own words. Right. He said that, as I think it was in Playboy. But, um, no, it's just, just interesting that these things are brought up. He mentions the performance of Richard Corey. Yes, that was, very, that was quite interesting, too, that... Uh, and uh, the comment about uh, about uh, Denny Lane being the suicidal one. I well, he's was, joking there. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, it, well, it was. It was funny. But it's something I've always wanted to know about because it's an unusual choice mm -hmm. for Wings to have done during the Wings Over America tour. Mm -hmm. I mean, everything else really was original material. And they chose a Paul Simon song, which uh, Simon and Garfunkel recorded. And it's all about a guy who has everything. He's wealthy and he ends up com committing suicide. And so that's why Paul made that reference about Denny being the suicidal one. But that was Denny's choice. Well, Denny what's really that. interesting, though, was how little time they spent on the new album. That's true. They, it, it, the new album barely got, barely got any discussion at all. And it was only because Howard kind of in, in, you know, interjected it at the end. And, uh, I mean, they almost were out of time. They were actually, they'd, I think they'd actually said, you know, it's time to go, and then I think Rob, I think it may have even been Robin that brought it up, and it was it was kind of interesting that that it happened like that, and um, and they finally uh, they played uh, Queenie Eyes at the uh, at the end there, right? And, the new uh, single. That was the only the only song they played, right? And uh, and Howard, you know, Howard didn't gush about the whole album. I don't know whether he'd heard the whole album, but they did play Queenie Eyes, and uh, so that was. But but they really didn't do much else. Although he did ask Paul why another album. I mean, the standard question of why another album, why now? Mm -hmm. But you know, you would have expected a lot more on the new album. That's true. That. Well, Howard's so fascinated about the whole Beatle past, as we all are. Right. And I would have hoped that there would have been more about the new album and maybe a little bit past the Beatles. Mm -hmm. You know, it's my major gripe, as I've said to you and I've said on this show, that when Paul is interviewed, it's it's mainly about the Beatles and whatever the new album is. Same thing with Ringo. You know, what about the last 43 years <laughs> in between? Ask a few questions about that. Uh, Howard did bring up um, Get Back, the song Get Back, and that right. John thought that the song was being written about Yoko, and then Paul denied that. And he said that, you know, John was... Very paranoid at the time. Too paranoid, I guess, mm -hmm. as far as uh, relating that to the song. Um, they brought up um, Getting Better. The Which was, that was an interesting discussion, because, he, because uh, Howard concentrated on the beat my woman all the time, you know, the woman beating right. part of the lyrics, and, and Paul had to say, no, 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 that wasn't it at all. <laughs> Which yeah, was, but I, mean, I believe that is supposed to be John's line in the song. Mm -hmm. He didn't just write, couldn't get much worse, which is what Paul is always bringing up. But I've, I've read 
I don't know how accurate it is because you don't know whether to believe a lot that's in the books, but that that particular line, I used to be cruel to my woman, I beat her and kept her apart from the things that she loved, that was from John. Mm -hmm. Which would sound like a John line, but more importantly, is it factual? Does it remain? Does it have any basis in fact? Mm. And 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 McCartney said, you know, no, we were just putting that stuff in, you know, to throw it out there. However, and this is, you know, interesting. When Cynthia Lennon was at Beatle Fest, she intimidated that John could be extremely, you know, extremely, you know, had quite a temper. Mm-hmm. She did. I don't recall her saying, you know, that he that he beat her but i mean there i mean in the 60s um things were you know when guys got macho things were things were unusual you know it, it, i mean it's uh, probably not the the con the conduct then would not have been accepted today right so that i was, don't know I, we we all we all know john had a temper mm-hmm. and we also know he couldn't handle liquor very well right so, uh howard also asked if he ever wrote a song that he thought was a stinker and mm-hmm. he mentioned the song Etc., mm-hmm. which has been written about for for quite a while. Mark Lewison's written it in uh, the Beatles recording sessions. You know, that was around the time of uh, 1968, and he wrote the song for Marianne Faithful, and he didn't think much of it. You know, mm-hmm. and he said, you're never going to hear that song. <laughs> oh, I could I could mention a couple of songs, that, that uh, a couple of Lennon McCartney songs that I think are... Or stinkers too. I mean, there's a couple of the the BBC songs. One and one is two is the first one that comes to mind. That I think is absolutely horrible. Uh, I really don't like that song. Um, All right, uh, I think it's okay. It's, it's certainly even not. Though, even though Scylla did it, that's another one I don't particularly care for. Hmm. I like that one. Do you? Hey, really? hey, yeah. You know, Paul. Paul has said that he really didn't think much of that means a lot. There's a, yeah. That's a, and that's another one. That's another one that I don't particularly care for. Oh, I thought it was a pretty good one. Really? I still don't think it was good enough to release, but it wasn't that bad a song. I remember the... the uh, if You've Got Trouble, I would, I'm would. i not that crazy about it. That means a lot a, was okay. There's another one. There's another one. See, I don't like that one either. And and I don't think it has anything to do with uh, uh, Ring, the fact that Ringo sings it, but it's just it's just not not a good song. It, it, maybe, maybe if Paul had sung it, would it would have sounded better it would have fit his voice better it definitely didn't fit Ringo's voice mm, I never thought about that <laughs> anyway well, th- I mean think about it I mean Ringo's voice as we all know is, is you know is, is limited right I mean, it has its limitations and that song goes kind of all over the place and it just did not seem like it was in you know Ringo's wheelhouse if I can use that. I don't know. I, I think it suits him very well, actually. I Do think it's really? I think it doesn't take that much <laughs> of a range, of a vocal range to sing that song. I don't think it's all over the place at all. I don't think it's a vocally demanding song at all. You don't want to hear me sing it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Okay, well I'll go with you on that. <laughs> okay. Also, um Howard asked the first song that John and Paul wrote together and Paul said just fun. Interesting that yeah he brought that up because when he was on, um, was it Jimmy Fallon? Which was the show where he mentioned I saw her standing there as the first song? And I'm going, you got to be kidding. That can't be your answer. <laughs> didn't, but, he, didn't he, for the Unplugged show, say, um, what was it? I um, Lost My Little Girl. Yeah. That, no, that's the first song he wrote by himself. Oh, okay. Just like Hello, Little Girl is supposed to be the first song that John wrote by himself. Okay. But he said just fun. Interesting he mentioned that. <laughs> Having just started to read the the Lewison book, uh, tune in uh, all all these years. The name of the book, tune in, is Volume One. But Mark Lewison says the first Lennon McCartney song was too bad about sorrows. The second one was just fun. Whatever. <laughs> but just the fact that it's brought up in this interview is interesting. And then also, why don't we do it in the road? He brings up. Yeah, that was one of the very memorable parts of the interview. Uh-huh. Um, because uh, he asked. Yes, McCartney, uh, if it was written after seeing two monkeys mating, and McCartney confirmed it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I thought was interesting. Yeah, he told the story about that. And it's just yeah, the I fact did. that Howard brought that up, because it has been written about in various places, and uh, and Paul did confirm it. Mm-hmm. So not your typical questions. No, and they never are with Howard Stern. Right. Never are. 
So, uh, very quickly, you want to talk about Jimmy Fallon? Yeah, I really thought the Fallon interview was inconsequential. I thought Fallon spent far too much time handing out praise and and uh, gushing and, and not enough time thinking up good questions. I really did not enjoy... I thought the I compared it to the compare it to the uh, Jimmy Kimmel interview, and I thought Kimmel's was way better, much better. I don't know. It's just that I know that Jimmy Fallon is a real fan, and he knows more than just the Beatles stuff. So I appreciate when someone like him gets to interview Paul, and like the first time he interviewed Paul, he brought up a whole bunch of stuff that was post Beatles. You could tell he really knew his stuff. Mm -hmm. So on that level, I'm very happy that Jimmy Fallon got to interview Paul. And you know, it's very funny. I, I, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, they're both very funny guys. They have their own style altogether, their own comedic style. And um, st st it wasn't an interview with substance. Yes, I'll grant you that. The performances on Jimmy Kimmel were wonderful. Yeah, the uh, live, especially the, the new songs, were much better. They've, the band is actually is getting more comfortable with those songs, clearly, right. than they have been. And uh, so that was... That was good, and even and and again the comedy bit that he and McCartney did didn't measure up to the scrambled eggs one, which will be, which is immortal. <laughs> that was immortal. Funny. Don't you think that's going a little bit too far? Well, compared to you know having McCartney bump his head, um, yeah. And they're switching each o each other's switching accents. accents. Yeah, yeah, that really you know that was kind of that was that didn't take a whole lot of thought. I don't think. Well, you know, this whole thing with both Jimmy Fallon and Howard Stern, you, you get the impression, since you find out about it at the last minute, practically, it was probably something that was very quickly decided. So there mm -hmm. wasn't much preparation for this, I think. I think the, the Fallon thing was actually, actually came out last week. And um, so, I, because uh, TV shows typically get word several days in advance, not usually the day before. So there, I think there was enough time for the writers to, to play with something and to, to do something really good, and they didn't. And um, and it, it really, I think it showed. Hmm. But okay. I don't know. Maybe everybody was in panic mode. I, or, and I and I again, I don't watch Fallon every night. McCartney also was not the only guest on Fallon. That's which true. Is again, another criticism we gave to to Jimmy Kimmel mm -hmm. that you know for a guy like McCartney, it should have been just McCartney and why it's not I don't know but right but I agree with you completely you know what I found interesting is that nowadays it's becoming very common that when an artist is on a late night talk show there's bonus material that they throw on on the website of the show mm -hmm. and there wasn't one for Jimmy Fallon no there I mean, wasn't although uh, Fallon tweeted out uh, um, that day that McCartney played a lot more than they used so hmm I wonder yes. why it's not uh, why they weren't given permission to run that. I don't know. I don't know. He said they he said they did a mini concert. So I uh, I got the impression from the tweet that they did a whole bunch of songs. They didn't just do the three songs that you that you saw. Hmm. So I kind of like it now when you get all that bonus stuff. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I talking about the songs that he did. I'm glad he did the two new songs. I wish uh, they had done one other song from the album instead of doing Lady Madonna. Or at least another song besides Lady Madonna. But well, the thing is, you know, Paul's probably, he feels he's got to do a song that everybody knows. Right. And if he's limited for time, if you're going to play two songs for the new album, and you don't have that much time left, you've got to play a short song. And Lady Madonna fits the bill. You know, it's, certainly it's not the only short song in the Beatles catalog. Right. But for one that Paul sang, one that gets everybody up, it's got a great introduction there on the piano, it's, it's the perfect song. Mm hmm Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's no problem with recogni recognition, that's for sure. Mm hmm I think a lot of it has to do with, you got three songs to play, you only got ten minutes, what are you going to fit in there? Right. I would much rather, I'd like to see him do Hi, 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 you know, like he's done recently, uh, sure. Stephen Colbert, something like that, songs that he's done in concert, some mm -hmm. surprises there. Uh, but if you only got a couple minutes, Lady Madonna fits the bill perfectly. Yep. So anyway, that puts a wrap on this show. And uh, very likely the next show will be on Paul, too. <laughs> One never knows. But uh, we are fast approaching the new album being released, which comes out on October the 15th, which is a Tuesday. 
Right. So um, probably since we record our shows on a Wednesday, we're going to be listening to the album about 10 times before we do the show. True. <laughs> I have all the songs in my head. So I'm looking forward to that. Mm-hmm. I've been listening to Queenie Eye uh, uh, a lot, and uh, that's growing on me too. Uh, I have a feeling it's going to be hard to criticize this album because uh, so far uh, both of the songs are just are really uh, are really knocking me over. So mm-hmm. we'll see what happens. Okay, we will see. We will see. All right. So before we go, special thanks to Michael Lynch for the wonderful theme that he has composed for us. The theme for Ken and Steve. <laughs> Clever title there, Michael. And of course. Many thanks to you, our listeners, for tuning in. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci saying, we will see you next time.